ان شاء الله اوكي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم <coughs> So we left off talking in the book about God's emissaries about Nabi Musa alayhi salam going to meet Fir'aun So uh, it says the night the message came Go forth with my signs, you and your brother Harun, and do not like leave off in remembering me. Both of you go to Fir'aun, for he has rebelled. Speak to him softly. Maybe he will take heed out of fear for me. Ask him, are you inclined to purify yourself? Shall I guide you to your Lord so that you fear him as he ought to be feared? We see here, then Musa salam, is going to the tyrant of the time. The worst person that we can think of of this era is Fir'aun. And we see that Allah uh, told him that he should speak gently towards people, even if they are transgressors. Uh, because we're truly concerned about their well-being. That Musa is saying, "Are you?" Allah told him to ask, are you inclined to purify yourself and I will guide you towards your Lord? We don't want to be harsh or rebuking towards them and to give them no hope that there's no way of turning towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No matter how bad the person is, we need to go to them in a nice way and with the best akhlaq. And think of how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa rahmatul alameen, the mercy to the world, would approach this type of people. We cannot go to them swearing at them and cursing at them and these type of thing and think that we are going to guide them towards Islam in this type of way. Because it's not going to do that. It's just going to anger them and make them more uh, against us. And we have to go to them in a nice way and call them towards, uh, towards our path as Musa alayhi salam is calling uh, Fir'aun towards his path Allah told him to speak to them gently so the, the two brothers Musa Harun there discussed their plan Musa alayhi salam says Lord we fear that he will not uh, that he will forestall us or overstep the bounds they are you know going to the tyrant of the time it's a very uh, frightening type of situation to go do that so Allah said don't be afraid for I will be with the two of you, hearing and seeing whatever happens. Approach him and say, we are envoys of the Lord of all the worlds. Let the Bani Israel go free with us and stop torturing them. We have brought you proofs from the Lord. May, may Allah's peace be upon him who follows this guidance. So Musa and Harun, they made dua. They asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give them strength to soften the Pharaoh's heart, to open his ears. And when we, we, should listen, we should listen and take advice from this also, when we have to go in front of some difficult situation where someone is against us, we have to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to soften their heart towards us, to uh, re remove the hatred they have from uh, their hearts, the hatred they have towards us or to soften them, make them inclined towards us. We have to ask Allah's help in these things. The next morning they went to the palace uh, dressed only in those, in, you know, the clothing of uh, shepherds, like the coarse woolen clothes. And they had their shepherd staff in their hands. And they went and they requested permission to speak with Pharaoh. Imagine they're like, who are these two guys, these two shepherds, what do they want? Normally, we can say that he's used to entertaining dignitaries or diplomats or these type of people who come with a fancy entourage and clothes and these type of things and gold and all these ornaments, but they are coming humbly in the this way. So, Fir'aun was in session with his advisor, Haman, and uh, they they let them in. So they entered, they had a huge hall, and it were, had giant columns going up towards the sky, and the walls and the ceilings had uh, gold decorations on them and colored hieroglyphics and all of these type of things. 
they were about to meet Fir'aun. And this hall that they had was meant to make people feel small. When they go in there, they're like, wow, I'm in this uh, you know, place. And they feel that uh, intimidated because of this. So Musa and Harun, they didn't pay attention to this. And they, uh, you know, they didn't pay attention to the far side of the hall where Fir'aun was sitting on his throne. He had a golden throne and he, he had jewels all over him from head to foot. Nicest of clothes that you could imagine in that time. Uh, probably silk clothes and these type of things. So his advisor stood uh, behind them and uh, they had a whole row of advisors there. So Allah told his prophets, he said, don't let his garments put fear in you. For his forelock, his for, forelock here is in my hand, is in my grasp. He cannot do anything. Uh, do not be amazed by the trappings and luxury of this world which he has been provided with. For if I wanted to, I could have adorned you with such things like this. Upon seeing them, uh, when Fir'aun saw them, uh, Fir'aun would have, uh, you know, uh, it says Fir'aun would have seated that all his power pales before it. Instead, I steer you clear of all of that, and I steer all that clear of you. This is how I treat my friends. Uh, sometimes people get intimidated by those who have money and expensive things, but these things don't really mean anything in reality. Allah gives the power and the honor to his righteous servants. No matter this person has all of these golden things and nice things, it doesn't matter because Allah honors his servants. Imam Hadi, alayhi salam, he addresses uh, Mutawakkil Abbasi, the 10th tyrant of the Abbasids. He said this line of poetry to him. Uh, we see the bravery of Imam Hadi, alayhi salam, and what he said to him, when he has all of these nice things and he thinks that he is the most powerful person in the land and that he is more powerful than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Imam recites these lines of poetry. He said, they made the lofty and high peaks their residence and permanently stationed armed guards to watch over them. But none of those could stop the death from approaching them. They think they are safe. They think they can put guards there and they have these uh, palaces on top of you know, mountains, for example, or someplace no one can reach them, but no one can stop Malik of Maut, the angel of death. The, then he said, finally and consequently, after all that grandeur, they were dragged from their grand palaces into the ditches of graves and how unfortunately they fell into those bad steeps. After the burial, the voice of the caller of Allah was raised, saying, where did those decorations, those crowns, those adornments that you had, where did they go? Where did those wealthy and luxurious faces in front of whom curtains were hung and placed, where did they go? At the time of their being questioned, the grave answers eloquently, these are the faces which are presently the attacking spot of the worms and the insects. They ate and drank for a long time, all that they desired in this world. And right now they are themselves being eaten by insects. For ages they built houses to dwell in, but they got separated and away from those houses and transferred to another place. They had been accumulating riches and wealth for a long time, but now they are dispersed of all that wealth among their enemies and they departed from this world. So we see that Imam Hadi alayhi salam says that we are not fooled by these things. These things will all leave and they don't mean anything. And Musa alayhi salam is, is in the same uh, position when he is seeing Fir'aun, that these things don't mean anything. Allah told, tells him, don't even bother with these things. Don't let them intimidate you. Don't let them make them feel like you are inferior because they have uh, many things. He says, I steer them clear of this world's trappings. Uh, like a shepherd steers his flocks clear of perilous terrain. And this is not to disparage you, but rather that you may fully and soundly be availed of my true blessings to you. 
my friends adorned themselves. Instead of with all of these things that Fir'aun had, Allah says, my friends adorned themselves with humility, subservience, and fear which springs which, which spring spontaneously from hearts, from their hearts and become manifest on their bodies. These attributes constitute their metal and their mantle, their, the source of this, their salvation, their station and their greatness and the very mark by which they are known. Musa, if you meet one of them, be humble and gracious with him and soften your heart and your tongue to him. This is saying if you meet people like this that have these qualities, he says, Allah says, if anyone terrorizes my friends, then he has thereby declared war on me, and I will avenge my friends on day of resurrection. We have to remember this saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we see these tragedies happening in the Muslim world, in places like Afghanistan and Pakistan, for example, where people are being hunted and killed because of their beliefs of following the path of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. We have to remember that those who terrorize Allah's friends, then Allah will uh, take revenge from them on day of judgment. He will account and take into account what they have done. And Allah will give justice on day of uh, resurrection, on day of judgment. And we will, who all those who suffered on those days and in this life, they will get their reward in the hereafter. And those people who punished and uh, terrorized the lost friends, they will be dealt with. They will not go without uh, accountability for their actions. It says Musa offered us a prayer saying, O oh Allah, I will defend you even by striking at his throat. I seek your protection against his evil and I seek your help. In response to this prayer, Allah would replace the, fear, uh, replace the Pharaoh's arrogance with fear. So Musa said, I am not afraid of him. I would even fight him if I had to, uh, because I, most no one would say they would fight Pharaoh. Imagine like someone coming and saying they would fight the most powerful man in the land. Uh, who, you know, everyone is terrified of this guy. But Musa said, I am so uh, courageous due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having, we can say like having my back, that I would not uh, be afraid of him. And we have to remember this in our life that we, we encounter situations that might strike fear into us, that we have to remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, has the back of his uh, servants. He, he strengthens them. He will support them and he will uh, protect them from these things. <clears throat> so Musa alayhi salam, he went to uh, talk with Fir'aun. Fir'aun thought that, okay, there are just some lowly shepherds. Uh, they want to come talk about some small thing. So Fir'aun didn't really pay them much attention. He only like uh, just entertained the, the idea of having them there and gave some formalities and they came. So when they were before Fir'aun, Musa addressed him in respectful way, that, like Allah ordered him to do. Because uh, we have to give respect. We have to be honorable. We cannot come to people in a... Uh, imagine we come to someone in a disrespectful way. Why would they want to come to our religion? If we come to them in the in a rude way, in a bad way, we cannot uh, lead off with that because it's not going to give any results. We cannot come uh, to someone and curse at them or, uh, you know, tell them all the bad things that they are, you know, uh, doing, for example, uh, we need to come to them in a respectful way and think about their feelings on what would attract that person to leave the bad things that they are doing and come to Islam, because we want them to give up what they're doing. We are concerned with their hereafter. We want to give them a chance to come towards the path of Allah, but going to them aggressively is not going to do it. We have to go to them in a kind and a gentle way as Allah told Musa to do. So Musa came to him respectfully. He used his kunya. He said, uh, Ya Abu uh, Mus'ab, this is the kunya of Fir'aun. So it's like someone coming and, and instead of calling you by their name, they call you their your kunya. Uh, for example, when 
uh, I'm in Iraq. People don't call me Mateen. They call me Abu Ali after my uh, son's name. Uh, so they, they use a respectful term. And this is a, ter a way of endearment to be nice and respectful to the person. So they come and they, they call, uh, he calls him by his kunya. And he said, we are messengers from your Lord, the Lord of all the worlds. It's not fitting for me to say anything about Allah except the truth. Let the Bani Israel go free with us. Stop torturing them. We have brought you proofs from the Lord. May Allah's peace be upon those who follow this guidance. And it's been revealed to us that punishment awaits whoever turns away from this message. And uh, he said, Abu Mus'ab, you, are you inclined to purify yourself? Shall I guide you to your Lord so that you fear him as he ought to be feared? So Fir'aun, he thinks himself as the most powerful, the sole authority in the land, in all of the world. Uh, so he definitely will not take this type of news well. So he is arrogant and he wouldn't see fit for it for him, you know, to bow down or submit to a higher power uh, other than himself. And, he, and especially seeing these people the way they are dressed in the position that they have in society is, is not a, a high position uh, according to their standards. You know, why would I listen to these people? Uh, why would I take their advice? So he was kind of shocked by the content of these statements and the confidence that Musa had and also the eloquence which the words were spoken. So Fir'aun looked a little bit closer. He wanted to see who is this person with so much courage. He said, are you not Musa? He guessed, he thought this must be Musa. So Musa said, yes, I am Musa. So Fir'aun shook his head and said, what gives you the gall or the, you know, the uh, audacity to come and enter my court and talk to me? Who do you think you are to come to me? He said, uh, he said, did my wife and I not raise you in our midst as our own child? And did not, did you not live with us for all these years in your life? Musa said, yes, this is true. Uh, many times people think that uh, they, you know, they think that when they help you in the way of Allah, that they somehow own you and can cash in on that favor anytime they like. And this shows uh, they really didn't do it for Allah, but rather they had some other ulterior motives. It brings to mind the story of uh, Bilal. Uh, Bilal was the mu'adhan or the caller to prayer for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And this story happened after the uh, martyrdom of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And we're all familiar with the, you know, everyone was familiar with the voice of Bilal. They're always waiting to hear, you know, his call to prayer. They always wanted to hear him call people towards uh, Salat, towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, however, when after, after Rasulullah, when uh, Abu Bakr, he got the caliphate, he decided to go to the mosque in that capacity and stand in the prophet's prayer niche in the mihrab. So that this, he means that uh, he might strengthen the pillars of his government and he can contact those people directly. So the first step for the formation of a gathering and the people coming to the mosque while the prophet was alive was the saying of Adhan by Bilal inviting them to the mosque. Whenever they called Adhan outside of prayer time, it mean that everyone need to go to the masjid. So, however, Bilal, he did not say Adhan after Rasulullah. After he was martyred, he didn't say Adhan at all. And he was very sensitive to this. And the most, nat he said, it says the most natural, and at the same time, the most dangerous tactics that Bilal employed against the caliph, his protest, we can say. Uh, from that point onward, Bilal did not participate in any official gatherings of them, of the uh, Ahlul Saqifa, those people who came and took the uh, caliphate from uh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salam.
So Balao was protesting. In the absence of Balao, who had that uh, delicate post of Mu'adhan, uh, from the you know uh, from the viewpoint of society, he could make people think about the problem that is going on now in their time, and that someone else has occupied this position that the prophet did not give. Uh, you know, um, he didn't give them permission to do that. We already know that in the day of Gadir Khum, man kuntu maula fahada Ali and maula. Whoever I am the master of, then this Ali is his master. So the supporters of the caliph thought that if Balao said the adhan, then the cry of the opponents of the caliph would die down. And the people would come to the masjid as they were accustomed to doing when they heard the, uh, the voice of Balao. The saying of adhan by Balao could draw a curtain on the intrigue of the administration of the uh, caliph of that time, of Abu Bakr. So, and it could deceive the simple-minded people and common people. But with these thoughts in mind, they, they went and they sought after Balao. They located Balao after they searched for a while, and they asked him to say the Adhan for the Salat. So Balao had been trained in the lap of Islam for 23 years and had been you know, directly concerned with all the events which formed the history of the nation uh, that Prophet had established. He recognized, accepted Islam with ikhlas, with sincerity. And he heard that the Prophet, what the Prophet had said in regard to the leadership, the walayat, and uh, with the, to the leader and the leadership. Especially he was aware of the, you know, very clear remarks of the Prophet about the position of Caliph going to Imam Ali alayhi salam. And he knew that this new ruling administration had come to power against all other things, against the orders of Allah, against the orders of Rasulullah. They, you know, they took it without permission. According to the belief of Balao, only the commander of the faithful, Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, was entitled to sit in that position. So in the circumstances, it's evident as to what reply Bilal is going to give as soon as they approach him. So the messengers of the caliph of the time, they insisted that Bilal call the adhan, but Bilal repeated the same reply every time and did not pay any attention to them. By not saying this adhan, Bilal wished to you know, have the people think about the matter, think about what's going on and to remind themselves gradually of the time of Rasulullah and the recommendations that he made regarding Imam Ali alayhi salam and to the position of Imamat. So it was this reason that when people asked him as to why he didn't say Adhan, he said in reply to them, after Rasulullah, I will not say the Adhan for any other person. On the other hand, uh, the non-participation of Imam Ali alayhi salam, uh, Salman, Abu Dhar, Zubair, Balal, Mikdad, Suhaib, all of these other companions, they all withdrew from these gatherings. So they were usually formed in the masjid and this strengthened Balal's stand and became the cause of the people doubting the right, you know, the, the rightfulness and the legality of this uh, new uh, administration. So, administration of the caliph, they were scared. They were scared, they were worried, and because this stand that Balao took against them, and they tried to make him surrender. They tried to make everyone fall in line with what they wanted. So, it was in this state of fear that the caliph, he sent some people formally to Balao to make, the in quote the, the author, he well, the author, he says, to make the obstinate and inflexible black man surrender. So they said that he is rebelling against me and he, we will make him bend. And uh, they wanted him to surrender to the, his position and accept him and pledge allegiance to him at any cost, either by promises or by threats or by money or position, whatever they had in their hand, they would use it. But Balal is not like this. You cannot trick Balal in these type of ways. So Balal was not prepared to ignore the truth. 
to do as the it says uh you know do as the romans do just to everyone else except him to go with the flow and go with that he saw islam uh personified in imam ali alayhi salam and he believed that even if the recommendation of the holy prophet had not been there for example and no one except imam ali alayhi salam was fit for that position he knew this and he was convinced that true islam was the same that was put forward by Imam Ali alayhi salam and his friends, even though they were, you know, few in number that stood with Amir al-Mu'mineen, he knew the truth was with them. So he had borne hardships before. Uh, he suffered torture, you know, under the, you know, for, for the sake of Islam. And now he could see that uh, it's like a plaything in the hands of the administration now that they don't really care about islam these people just want position and power and to take over this uh empire sort of to make an empire out of it so he gave the clear-cut reply to these representatives that came he said in these words i will not say the adhan for anyone except for the whom the the person for whom the holy prophet had appointed you know at last uh omar Ibn al-Khattab, his close friend with Caliph Abu Bakr, he considered to be the, you know, the most important one to put him in that position uh, as he raised his hand and said, I pledge allegiance to him. And then other people did the same thing. So he wanted to discuss this matter with Balao. And this is where the point comes uh, about someone putting something over you that they did in the sake of Allah, but really it was for some other motive. So, <clears throat> when Umar saw Balal, he said that uh, now I will make him surrender and I will take him out of the fold of the opponents of the Caliph. He would take him away from Imam Ali. So after giving salam, saying a few things, uh, Umar said, Ya Balal, why have you left us alone in these days? Well, we haven't seen you in a while, you know. How come? I was very keen that you would be with us so that we could entrust with you some task, some duty, some position. Why don't you come to the masjid? We expect that you say adhan, you call the people to masjid to offer prayers with the caliph of the holy prophet. I understand that you have said that you will no longer say adhan anymore. How come? Do you remember that this very Abu Bakr delivered you from slavery and from persecution from your cruel master? Is it proper that now you should abandon him and now you won't say adhan for him? Just like Fir'aun tells Musa, how come you come to my house and tell me these things and I raised you in my house? They put this over their head. So Omar put this over Balao's head. Didn't Abu Bakr free you from slavery and now you won't call Adhan for him? How come? It's not proper for you to do that. Like you owe everything to Abu Bakr. So Balao started thinking about all the events that happened in his life, his persecution, the time that they were you abandoned, to about 10 of them. the time that they were homeless, his migration to Medina, the times he okay, fought she's in there, but I don't know, how, I don't know what she's talking about. For example, <clears throat> uh, then the conquest of Mecca, then he thought about the passing away of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He said to Omar, he said, how happy we were in the days when Rasulullah was amongst us and invited the people to Allah and to justice. How hard and dark and calamitous these days are. With what conditions are we in now? Then Bilal turned the conversation uh, to the matter under discussion. He was started to cry. He's thinking about this time Rasulullah is passed away and no longer here. And now he's having to deal with all of this stress that he has. He said, let us see whether Abu Bakr uh, purchased me for the sake of Allah and set me free for the sake of Allah or had he some other motive if he did all this for the sake of Allah why does he not why uh, he doesn't enjoy any other right over me if he did it for the sake of Allah that's it he doesn't he doesn't own me he doesn't have any right over me and if he did not act for the sake of Allah I am still his slave under his control but I am free in the matter of my faith and as I have already said, I'm not going to say Adhan for any other person after Rasulullah. 
Furthermore, I'm going to swear allegiance only to that person whose allegiance is my responsibility. I accept that only that person as caliph who has been nominated by the Holy Prophet as his successor. And then I say to you, if Abu Bakr had not purchased me and set me free on that day, and I would have died in that condition, because I was then certainly a true mu'min and would have gone to Jannah when they put that rock on, Abu, on uh, Balaw's chest and they told him to pray to that idol and give up Allah, he only would say, Al-Ahad, Al-Ahad, there's only one God. If I died in that position, I was going to Jannah as a shaheed, is what he told him. And then he says, but in the present circumstance, when you want me to participate in this matter, I don't know what I would be destined to go to paradise or to hellfire and whether I can preserve my faith or not. He said, you are calling me towards something that will take, that I will, my faith will leave me and I will go to Jahannam if I follow you. I only follow Amir al-Mu'maneen Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, the brave personality of Balal and his protest against the administration by refraining from calling Adhan. It's very inspiring when we read about these uh, companions of Amir al-Mu'maneen alayhi salam. So we see sometimes people hold this over us. They maybe do something for you. And they say, uh, then later on, they say, oh, remember that time I did this and such and such and such for you? Uh, now you owe me. Did you do this for Allah? Or did you do this for, uh, you could come and call on me some other time for later, you know? So, uh, we, it clearly exposed uh, their true intention. So Fir'aun, he continued, uh, he said, but then you, uh, you did that bad crime of yours, thereby joining the ranks of those uh, Bani Israel, those disbelievers and those bad people. So Musa, he paused for a moment. He said, uh, I did that when I was lost. In his heart, he meant that uh, he had killed the Egyptian before he had been graced with the divine guidance, when he had only his limited intelligence to go on. He had deemed intervention between the Egyptian and the Bani Israel man the best path, without knowing that the Egyptian would accidentally die, or that the person from Bani Israel was unworthy of his help. But when he said, I was lost, he knew that Fir'aun would hear what he wanted to hear. He would take it in a different way that Musa had perpetuated his crime and was now vindicating himself because he had been ignorant and foolish at the time. This is what Fir'aun would think he would, he would take from it. But what Musa really meant was something else. So Musa hoped that such an admission might soften the Pharaoh's heart to listen to you know further what he had to say. So Musa continued on. He said, I fled from you because I feared you. Then my Lord gave me sound judgment and made me one of his messengers. Having vindicated himself and laid claim to his credentials, he went on the offensive with Fir'aun. He took issue with the favor of the Fir'aun, apparently felt that he had the right to hold over him. And uh, he said, uh, and it is the favor you hold over my head that you enslave the Bani Israel. It was true that Fir'aun and his wife had raised him. However, he considered it not such a great favor since it was Fir'aun's oppressive rule and he did policies of genocide that left his mother no choice but to throw him in the river in the first place. He would have never been there in the house of Fir'aun if Fir'aun hadn't been killing Bani Israel. So he's like, I was in all of this because of what you were doing in the first place. <clears throat> then Fir'aun sidestepped this attack by Musa and asked, who is this Lord of yours? Uh, yeah, Musa, tell me, who is this Lord you're talking about? So Musa replied, our Lord is <clears throat> he who gave everything its existence. Then he guided it. He said, uh, this answer surprised Fir'aun. Musa seemed to be speaking of the creator, but everyone in that time, they thought that the creator was too high too sublime to have anything to do with the day-to-day -day affairs of the world. So the Egyptians believed 
that he had delegated all these duties to lesser gods. And it was in their mind, it was crazy to think uh, Musa to claim to be a messenger from the creator. Because they said, no one can talk to the creator. We only talk to the lesser gods. And the lesser gods are the medium between them and the creator. So Fir'aun, he mentioned, he said, you mentioned something about a Lord of all the worlds. What is this Lord of all the worlds? This Rabb al-Alameen you're talking about. Egyptians uh, created a mythology with a lot of different gods, Lord of the natural elements. There was a Lord of the river, a Lord of the rain, a Lord of the wind, all the other uh, things you can think of. They had a Lord for these things. And uh, they counted on this for their success. So Fir'aun, uh, he thought that he himself was the highest of all of these Egyptian lords these Egyptian gods and uh, it says that but he and his underling lords only ruled over the land of Egypt and neighboring countries and civilizations had their own lords the concept of one god or one singular lord who directly ruled over all of creation uh, was something that was long forgotten they said with the it, they drove it out of their memory with the death of Yusuf alayhi salam. And they left that ideology that Yusuf taught of la ilaha illallah, and they went toward uh, all these other gods. So Musa said, he is the Lord of the sky and the earth and all that is between them. If you seek the path to certainty. Fir'aun uh, jokingly, he started making fun of Musa to uh, uh, his uh, other people that were there his advisors, you say, do you not hear what he is saying? Like, what kind of joke is this? And uh, he's just rambling on about this thing and that thing. You know, <clears throat> uh, Allah says to advise people with uh, patience, surat uh, asr, watawasab is sabr, and advise and exhort with patience. If we look at this duty of you know, task of advising other people, it's very hard. It's very tiresome. At times, one can get so frustrated that he gives up on his people. He gets gives up on them being guided at all. And we have to look at Nabi Nuh, alayhi salam, that he called his people towards guidance for 950 years. In the end, only a handful of people believed. You know, most of us would have given up on the first year and even some people, we would have given up on the first day. Sometimes we're going to, we take away from this that sometimes we'll face rejection. Sometimes we'll face bad attitudes. Sometimes people will make fun of us. Sometimes people will curse at us. But the prophets of Allah faced all of these things and worse than these things when advising other people. So advising other people, it takes a lot of patience, a lot of courage, a lot of determination. And you have to have a very thick skin to deal with um, a general population of people because uh, sometimes people can be very difficult to deal with. So hence Allah says, wa sabr, advise with patience. So we see that Fir'aun was making fun of Musa. Now Musa has to have sabr. Imagine being a messenger of Allah, talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Yet these people are making fun of you. So we will leave here and we will continue next week and we will find uh, what the rest of the conversation between Fir'aun and Musa was, inshallah, uh, next week. Salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad.